Welcome home. Welcome to Discovery. And we're in week four. Week four of God, Love, Sex, Song of Songs. And I want to invite you to turn to chapter five. Turn to chapter five. Man, we need to celebrate Friday night. How about Friday night, the dinner and auction? What an awesome time. Anybody have a good time, man? I had a great time. I had the best time, I guess, and uh, so uh, nobody else will celebrate. I will celebrate, man. Woo, what a great time. What a great night. And uh, how about those brownies, right, Andrew? How about those brownies? Uh, what, did they, what, did they end, what did we end the night with? A, a slight confusion, uh, but it was like $700 uh, for, for four different brownie tubs. I don't know. It was craziness, but uh, what a great night, man. What a great night. I want to thank all of those that participated, those that bought tickets, those that showed up, those that shared it on social media, invited friends. Uh, those that uh, helped helped with the items to auction off. I mean, man, I'm just blown away uh, by uh, those uh, that are so committed to discovery and all that God is doing through his church. Amen. What an exciting season. What an exciting season. And uh, I just, uh, man, I'm just so blown away by the faithfulness of our God. And uh, so we're going to dive into uh, chapter 5. Here, but before we before we do that, last week we talked about the intimate blessings of marriage. What a message! What a message to preach! Uh, what is great sex? Essentially, that was the message. And so, uh, what a message! What a message to preach from chapter four of song uh, of songs. But the intimate blessings of marriage. One of the greatest intimate blessings of marriage is what God created, and it is beautiful. It is holy. And that is sex, and it draws the husband and wife together in a greater intimacy. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. What a call for the church to be able to share one of the greatest intimate, intimate blessings of marriage. Well, today we're looking at chapter 5. And it changes, the tone changes in chapter 5 from the first four chapters. The first four chapters are, uh, we kicked off the series in chapter 1 with qualities that that drew this uh, husband and and, and wife, this man and woman together. There's passion, they're leaping over the mountains. Uh, There's very, very clear descriptions of uh, all body parts. (laughs) And um, and so we, we read about that, we see that. Um, And then the tone begins to change in chapter 5. The honeymoon, if you will, is over in chapter 5. Conflict and tension arise in chapter 5, and and there's trouble in paradise. I don't know if anyone has ever experienced any trouble in paradise, uh, but that's what we're going to see in chapter 5. There's a little bit of trouble in paradise. Now, we got all perfect marriages in here. There's never been any kind of trouble in any of your paradise. Okay. Uh, you, you lie, you lie. Okay, here we go. Let's look at chapter, chapter five, verse two, chapter five. And let's look at verse two. I was sleeping, but my heart was awake. A sound, my love was knocking. I was sleeping, but my heart was awake. Anyone ever been there before? You've ever been there? I mean, you're just laying in bed, you're, you're laying in bed and your just mind is racing. Your heart is beating. You're wondering how this thing's going to work out. You're overwhelmed, you're stressed, there was just this this argument, whatever the case might be, the circumstance might be, that's how we find this woman. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is drenched with dew, my hair with droplets of the night. There's trouble in paradise. Verse 3, I have taken off my clothing, how can I put it back on? I have washed my feet, how can I get them dirty? She's ready for bed. That's what she's saying. Man, I'm already in bed. I'm naked, ready for bed. I'm cleaned up. I'm not getting out, right? Verse 4, my love thrust his hand through the opening, and my feelings were stirred for him. I rose to open for my love. My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my love, verse 6, but my love had turned and gone away. But my love had turned and gone away. My heart sank because he had left. I sought him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. Trouble in paradise. 
There's tension. There's conflict. There's a disagreement of some sort. And so before we go any further, what are, we're going to talk about some root causes of conflict. Some root causes of conflict. The first root cause of conflict that we're going to look at is, is, is Satan. Everyone say Satan. How many of you know he is a root cause of conflict in all of our lives? How many of you know that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? He's like a thief who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants nothing but destruction for you. He's the deceiver, the ultimate deceiver. And so Satan is one of the root causes of conflict in, in our lives. And not just, by the way, in the relational as far as uh, marriage or home, but in all aspects of li lives, in all aspects of relationship, in your workplace, among your family and friends, in your neighborhoods, you know, your communities. Man, Satan is a cause of conflict. And his attacks are coming every day at us. And in a few weeks, we're kicking off a teaching series titled, Not Today, Satan. Man, I hope you're ready for that. Anyone ever said that, by the way? Not today, Satan. Right? I, I, I've actually seen some of you post that, the memes on Facebook, but uh, I will continue on. Uh, Satan is one of the causes of conflict in our life. He wants to draw you back to the destruction, to the bondage, to the darkness, to the prison that you, if you are in Christ Jesus, were set free from. And so Satan is actively at work. One of the root causes of conflict in our lives. Uh, we need to be aware of it. His attacks, and so in a few weeks we're going to look at the Ephesians six, chapter six text of how do we withstand the attacks of the enemy? How do we put on the full armor of God? What's the point of all of this armor? The importance of prayer, so that we can say, "Not today, Satan." Each and every day of our lives, and so one of the root causes of conflict is is Satan. Uh, next is sin. One of the root causes of conflict is sin. S Satan, then then sin. We all battle different sin in our life. And the enemy is aware, by the way, of our most vulnerable points. Have you ever thought about it that way? But sin is one of the root causes of conflict in our lives. Pride being one form of sin. I know there's no proud people in the, in the room today or anyone that ever struggles with pride. But what does pride do? It builds up wall, a wall, a separation. And so sometimes you feel like you're talking to a wall in, this, in, in, in the heated moments when the tension is built, right, in any kind of relationship. And, and, and it might not be a literal wall, but in some form or fashion it is a wall because it's a wall of, of pride. And how can there be any kind of dialogue or any kind of discussion? How can we go anywhere if humility isn't present? And so scripture is very clear that as believers were to seek the humility of the Lord and how that pride is one of many sins that we struggle with. Beyond pride, any form of addiction. Any form of addic addiction is a root conflict of, 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 of uh, a root cause of conflict. Maybe there's something that you're struggling with today that perhaps no one else knows or you think no one else knows. I guarantee you somebody knows. Perhaps uh, you're in a relationship with someone that's struggling with an addiction or, or, or you grew up in a household that, that there was an addiction. And so you felt it, you heard it, you saw it at work. One of the root causes of Conflict in our lives is sin. And I want you to know today that Jesus came to set you and I free. To forgive all of our sins. To set you free from the bondage of any addiction, whatever it may be. I want you to know that today. But one of the root causes of conflict is, is Satan. One of the root causes of conflict is sin. Uh, next, self. Self, yes, you and me 
on one of the root causes of conflict. And some of you are like, no, no way, no way. It's always, it's always someone. And by the way, if, if it's always somebody else's fault, can I just address just for a moment before we go any further? There's, there's probably an issue, and it's probably you, okay? Can I, I just want, I, I want to be the voice to tell you that. If it's always someone else, right? It's always someone else, there's probably an issue, and perhaps it, it, it is you. And so uh, I say that in love, by the way. I say in love, please receive it in love with grace. But uh, self, I want what I want. Have you ever said that? Man, I'm going to do what I, 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 I'm going to do what I want to do. I, I work too, too hard. I'm always right. One of the root causes of conflict in any relationship is self. I want what I want. And so next thing we know, here we go. Man, there's tension in the air. And it's thick. You cut through it sometimes. All those that are around you sense something. They're, they, they sense, they can feel it on you. But one of the root causes of conflict, yeah, self. Self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. I sit down with couples that, that are... That are, that are struggling in their marriage, and, and, and I can hear real quickly and see real quick, uh, quickly that, that there's a self-centeredness that's happening. And until we say, Lord, man, destroy this, destroy the self, the selfish desires of my heart, and I want to be led by the Spirit of God. And that, that's when restoration begins. And so we have a decision every day. Are we going to be led by the Spirit of God, or are we going to be led by our flesh? And listen, the truth is, if we're led by our, our, our flesh... Conflict is going to continue to arise in our lives. Next root cause of conflict, I like to call stupid fights. Yes, that says, that says, that says stupid fights. Turn to the person next to you and let them know that there are stupid fights. There are stupid fights. Some of you maybe had a, a stupid fight this morning. Uh, you had a stupid fight this morning. And, uh, and, I, and I say this kind of in a joking way, but, but it's in all seriousness as well. There's so many times that we could save some conflict in our lives and our marriages and friendships if we were just to think before we said that, that thing, you know, that thing. We were to delete before we click post. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. They're stupid fights. One of the root causes of conflict in, our, in relationships. If we just took five. And some of you, it's, it's only five seconds. That's all you need. And some of you need five minutes. And, and, and others might even need five hours. But, but if we just take time to think through and process, Lord, what, what should my response be? We're going to talk about that here in just a moment. But one of the root causes of conflict, stupid fights. And then lastly, and I'm sure we can go on and on all day and talk about different root causes of conflict for sure. But, but one of the last in relationships is this. Don't miss this. Simple misunderstandings and miscommunication. If you think, no, that never happens, that never happens. No, you're, don't, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. It certainly does happen, but that's not up to me to remind you of those, those times, okay? Um, uh, this just, just root causes of conflict. Simple misunderstanding and miscommunication. I shared an example, the 930, that of sending a text message I heard from a couple. I asked them one time, well, is there any any issues in, in the relationship? And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of silly, but there is one. And I said, well, what is it? And they began to share the, the, that uh, they don't know how to read sometimes the text messages, like the responses, right? Any of y'all, no, all of you have perfect communication. And so, um, so I said, well, what do you mean? He said, yeah, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll ask this question and it's like just a thumbs up. What does a thumbs up mean? Like, and, and I said, exactly. See, for, for men, it's like thumbs up. It's like all good. Yeah, what, you know, we're good. But then the woman is like, I need more details. Give a detail. So, fellas, there you go, man. A little bit of advice. I don't have much, but a little bit of advice for you. Give some more details to, to the ladies, all right? Share a little more details than a thumbs up. All right, that might work. Like, my emoji, go-to emoji, is the, 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 the guy with the glasses. The, he's the cool guy, right? Cool. That, that's my emoji go-to. But I've learned that with my wife, I need to be a little more clear. I need to give a little more detail. One thing about text that you know is you, don't, you can't read body language, right? So you don't know, you really don't know, like, ah, do they, how are they really answering this? You know, what, what you know, so, so listen, what are the root causes of conflict? Simple misunderstanding and miscommunication. I would encourage you in every relationship, listen, I'd encourage you in every relationship to over-communicate. Over-communicate. I, I would encourage you in, in, in the re relational, the one that God's placed in your life, over-communicate, 
up. Sometimes all you can do is send a text, but the majority of times you need to pick up the phone and actually call them or, or wait till they get home. I mean, and really share, over communicate, but also in every form of, in your workplace, I mean, over communicate. Make sure it's clear when you're sending an email. I mean, read it five times. Don't just write it once and send. Trust me. Read it. Make sure it's clear and it's detailed. But some, one of the root causes is conflict. Simple misunderstanding and miscommunication. And listen, if we're not careful, all of these root causes of conflict, listen, I, I guarantee you the majority will start small and they just build and they just grow. They, they don't clear up on their own. They don't just, they don't expire over time. It just builds and grows. And that's what the enemy at the end of the day wants. He wants them to grow to a certain point so that there is in fact separation in your relationships. And Charles Spurgeon says this. I love it, man. Conflicts bring experience, and experience brings that growth and grace, which is not to be attained by any other means. You see that? Conflicts bring experience, and experience brings that growth and, and grace. The goal for all of us is growth. But the reality is, for, for some, it takes a really long time to understand that I don't want to keep repeating the things that I've done. Like, we don't want to keep going back to these arguments. Have you ever said that, by the way? Why are we arguing about this again? <laughs> but we need to grow from the conflicts. There should be growth from the conflicts in us so that we're not repeating the same things over and over again. Conflicts bring experience, and experience brings that growth and grace. I want to share four promises with us today. Four promises that before the conflict enters, we're committing to them today. Now, if, if you're in a conflict, go ahead and just make the commitment, right? Go ahead and make the commitment, trust me. But four promises. First is I promise to act and not react. I promise to act and not react. I'd encourage you to write that down. I promise to act and not react. What am I talking about? What I'm talking about is really the battle between the flesh and the spirit of God, as I said a moment ago. Our natural reaction when somebody comes against us is to react. But what the spirit of God says is to, to act thoughtfully, prayerfully, carefully, to act and not react, to act and not react. See, Max Lucado said this, conflict is inev ev inevitable, sorry, conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. And really, that's what we're pressing in today as we're, as we're talking about this thing of conflict. That's really the big idea today. Conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. We live in a broken world. It's going to happen. But combat is optional. And this is so true in our relationships. I promise to act and not react. Romans chapter 12 verse 21 says this. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I promise to act and not react. I promise to act and not react. Don't let evil conquer you. Man, we're walking with the Lord. We're growing in Christ Jesus. We've been set free and forgiven. Don't let evil conquer you. That was conquered, by the way, on the cross of Calvary. But conquer evil by doing good. I promise to act and not react. Next time the tension begins to build, and by the way, you know the feeling. You know it's coming. If you've been in a relationship with someone for a little while, you, you know what kind of the set-off points are. You, you, you know the stress levels that, can, that, that one can take. You, you, you know each other. And so once it begins to, to build, be careful and, and wise. I promise to act and not react. Second promise, I promise to focus on the good, not the bad. I promise to focus on the good, 
not the bad. Don't miss this promise. Don't miss this commitment. I mean, everywhere we go, we, we sense a negativity. Or, or But we have a decision to make. Well, I give in to that. I promise to focus on the good, not the bad. Have you ever been around a person that their whole world, they live in just a negative world? Have you ever, have you ever experienced a person like that? And if you're like that, I'm glad you're here today. Uh, you may be offended here. But uh, the, the thing about it is no one wants to be around that person. In fact, can we just be honest? When that person calls, it's like, nah, let it ring, man. Let that bad boy ring and just go to voicemail, right? Let it go to voicemail. Or, or, or and better yet, if they pop up on Facebook Messenger and you don't actually click on the message, you can just see that they've sent you a message. And so you avoid clicking on it because you know once you click on it, they see your profile that you've read it. And then they're on you like, why haven't you responded? Don't act like you've never done that before. I have never done that. I've never done that before in my life. <laughs> I've done it a few times. But you know, you know what, you know. As soon as you answer that, that, that call, you know what's coming. You're going to spend a half an hour just listening to everything that's crappy in their life. You, you know. It, 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 no one wants to be that person. Now, what would it look like, believer? Maybe, maybe you've been struggling, like you've been inching closer and closer to that person, by the way. And today, I hope this would be an encouragement to inch back closer to the Lord. But what would it look like that each day we woke up and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving me a new day. Today, I choose to celebrate you. What would it look like, believer, if we begin to count the blessings of God, as the old hymn says, and name them one by one, count your blessings, name them one by one. All right. What would it look like? Man, things would change in our lives. Things would change in the lives of people around you, guaranteed. I promise to focus on the good, not the bad. The enemy wants you solely focused on all the bad things that are happening in your life and in your relationship that, that, you, that you can't even think of the good things that are happening. Like how he's blessed you and your family. Like how, how you have a car to drive, how you have a, a roof over your head, how you have a bed to sleep in, how, how you have food in front of you. I mean, so many times we miss the good things in life because we're so consumed with all the bad things in life. I don't know what needs to change in your life to help you focus on the good things. Maybe you need to not watch so much of a TV or, or, or news for that matter. Uh, maybe you need to start picking up the Bible a little bit more. Maybe you need to get off Facebook a, a little bit you know, less. I don't know what needs to change in your life to help you to move to a different focus in your life. But once again, don't fall into the, the enemy's plans. He wants you focused on the bad so you're not focused on the good. And by the way, this isn't a prosperity message uh, one, one bit. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says this. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. I love that, man. Fix your thoughts. Everyone say, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Maybe you just need to write that out on an index card and, and maybe you just need to put it on your fridge or put, put it where you get ready in the morning, put it in your car. I don't know what you need to do. Maybe you need to hand it to somebody that's a little negative. You know what I'm saying? Kind of hand, slide it to them and just say, hey, this is just an encouragement for you today. I, I don't know, I don't know your, your response, but, but I know this. I promise, I promise, I promise to focus on the good, not the bad. Next promise. Now we kind of step into a little more of the relationship uh, between husband and wife, those that are engaged, those that are, you know, if you're in a dating relationship, it's, 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 it's kind of serious. You're looking towards marriage. This is kind of, this is kind of the third a promise we're stepping into. I promise to talk and not walk. I promise to talk and not walk. We, we see it every day. People make the decision 
That's just easier to walk, so I'm just going to walk. We're going to talk about it. We're, we're just, I, I'm just walking. I'm driving. I'm taking a, we, I, a week, you know, I, all these kinds of things. And, but I want to encourage you. Listen, listen, believer. I want to encourage you to talk and not walk, to talk and not walk. Now, may I just say this before we look at the scripture? Some of you need a cool down time. So when I say talk and not walk, what I'm saying is in, in a led by the spirit manner that you're talking, not in a flesh manner, not in a heated manner, not when you're most excited, right? We got any people that get excited in the house. You know what I'm talking about. No, no, no. What I'm saying is I promise to talk. So, so maybe, again, you need to put yourself in the timeout. <laughs> maybe you need to, to go to another bedroom. You need to just pray and just say, Lord, help me, guide me. I'm being, I'm being serious, by the way. I, this isn't elementary. But so many relationships would, would change if we just acted as if we were true believers of God and lived out his word. I mean, we take all this other stuff to God in prayer, but yet the relationship is, we just say, God, whatever, whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. What a foolish thought. Take it all to God in prayer. Ephesians 4.26 says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. One of the things Audra and I early on, and again, we, we never made this official. Uh, I, can't, I was thinking through it all this week, and it's like, no, we never sat down and said, we're, you know, this is kind of an official thing. Uh, but it just happened. It just happened. I, and, uh, and I believe it's because of God's word. But we made, you know, anytime there's tension to date, we've never gone to bed angry with each other. Now, sure, there's been some frustrations, I'm sure. I'm hard, I'm hard to deal with, man. Uh, God bless her, and I'm so thankful for her in my life. But in all honesty and reality, listen, we, we've made sure that before We've laid in bed together, the same bed together. Man, that we have taken time to talk what we're thinking through, what we're feeling, the frustrations. And at times, we've had to take an hour, a two hour, like to calm down, especially me, because I get really excited sometimes. But what would it look like in your relationship to talk and not walk, to not let the sun go down while you're still angry? Uh, scripture is very clear. This is what happens if we go to bed angry. This is what happens. And we give a foothold to the enemy. That's what scripture says. I didn't, I didn't just make that up. And, and, and I've come to the understanding as, as I've met and counseled a lot of couples that there are many couples that have given large amount of room to the enemy. A large amount of room to the enemy. Talk and not. Walk. Dialogue is the most effective way of resolving conflict. Just want to throw that out there. Dialogue is the most effective way. I'm talking face to face. Most effective way to effective communication. Here we go. Last uh, promise. I promise. I promise to never drop the D bomb. That's right. It says D bomb. I never. I, I promise to never drop the D bomb. This is something that that Audrey and I. Uh, from, from day one, we have been serious about. In a world, in a world full of D-bombs, for me and my home, we have chosen to never drop the D-bomb. We don't joke about the D-bomb. We don't talk about the D-bomb. The D-bomb does not come out of my mouth, our mouths, unless I'm preaching a message on the D-bomb. And the D-bomb that we chose from day one that would not be in our vocabulary is divorce. It's divorce. We have promised to never drop the D-bomb. You know, that's the first thought in a lot of our lives. When tension rises, when conflict presents itself, that's, if we're all, that's the first thought in a lot of lives. Why is that? Because we see it all around us. We see it all around us. 
Now, as I shared earlier, I want to share today as we begin to close. Listen, that there's, there's some that have, have taken that step, many in fact, that have taken that step of divorce. And, and I want you to know, I don't understand all the things of God and all the ways of God. I just want to be very upfront and honest and clear. But one thing that I have come to the understanding of God is that he works in different ways and does different things. And he is the God of new beginnings. Can I just say it that way? He's the God of new beginnings. What I've come to the understanding uh, when it comes to divorce is that there's two people involved and two people have to make this decision together. If they're going to try and work this thing out or if there's no working this thing out. That's what I've come to understand as I read through scripture, as I minister to people. But at the end of the day, listen, don't miss this. I am so thankful for the grace of God that covers all my sin. I'm thankful. I don't know where you're at today, those that are single, those that are engaged, those that are married, listen, but I would encourage you, right where you're at today, make this commitment. I will never drop the D-bomb. Mark 10, verse 8 says this. I love it, man. And the two are united into one. That's what happens in the covenant of marriage, right? The covenant of marriage, two people become one. They are no longer two, but one. Verse 9, let no one split apart what God has joined together. God is doing a new work. A new work. Listen, the grass is not greener on the other side. You, you hear it said all the time, it's, 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 it's greener over there. No, 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 the grass is greener where you water it. It's, it, it's true, where you water it. Where are your commitments today? Where are your, what promises have you made? Are you walking with the Spirit of God? Are you growing in Christ Jesus? I love how this chapter closes. Things change. Praise God. My love, verse 10, my love is fit and strong, notable among 10,000. So he's like, man, this guy's gone early on in chapter 5. So now he's back and, whoa, this is my man. I'm proud of him. Things have changed. Verse 16, this is my love and this is my friend. I love that verse. Some of you need to write that down, put it on a wall somewhere. This is my love. This is my friend. Things have changed. Things have changed. Chapter 6, verse 3, I am my love's and my love is mine. Do you see the commitment? Do you see the commitment? Hold on. It's not over. Man, there may be trouble in paradise, but thank God that his power is enough, that his grace is sufficient, that he is the God of new beginnings, that he is the God of comfort, that he is the God of peace. And thank God that we look to his example of what love really is. And we say today, I choose. I choose his love. God, I need your love. And so what we see in chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, is they endured another winter. And they grew, don't miss this, and they grew to enjoy spring. You see it in verse 11, I, I came down to the walnut groves of all places, walnut grove, to see the blossoms of the valley, to see the, the vines were budding and the pomegranates blooming. Come to check it out, what, what's, what's popping up fresh with the spring. They've made it through a difficult winter. And listen, some of you are in that winter right now, perhaps. And I want you to know, keep your promises so that you can experience the bloom of the, the spring. I felt like I was in a chariot with a noble man. I want to encourage you today to commit to these four promises. No matter where you're at, would you, would you commit to these these four promises today. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this place. Lord Jesus, thank you for how good and great you are. Thank you for your word, how it speaks to us, how it changes us, how life-giving it is. 
Lord, I pray for every relationship in the house, for every engagement, every marriage in the house. Lord, we know that the enemy's coming against us. Man, the tension is rising. The stress is out of control at times. But Lord, your word tells us very clearly that we have a decision to make and the decision are, are we going to worry or are we going to worship? And God, I pray that we would make the decision to worship you in and through all things. In and through the most difficult times, God, that we would worship you. We would choose to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for how good and great you are. I praise you. I bless your, your holy name. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.